Good morning and welcome to Hillside Community Church of 100 Mile House, BC, Canada. Happy New Year everyone. It's 2021. I'm just glad that you could join us for today's Sunday morning broadcast, January the 3rd, 2021. Welcome for all those that are outside of our congregation. We're glad that you joined us. For those that are part of our congregation, hopefully we'll be able to meet in person soon. Uh, I can't wait for that day, but uh, until that day, um, we bring this to you online. So let's bow in a word of prayer this morning prior to me starting my message. Heavenly Father, I'm so thankful for the opportunity to bring your word to the people. And God, I just pray that each person that's listening to this broadcast, God, that you would stir them by the power of your spirit to, to learn, to grow, to be strengthened, to be encouraged in the way that you would have them to be uh, to be encouraged or, or taught. And God, for, for those that are out there that may not know you, I just pray that you would speak by the power of your spirit, that they would see that you are real and that 2021 would be a year that they decide to follow you. And I praise you and I thank you for this day. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'm going to continue my sermon series in the book of 1 Peter, and we've arrived at chapter 4. And the theme thus far from chapter 3 leading into chapter 4 has been the suffering of the saints. And today we continue in with that theme. And my sermon title is uh, Living in Freedom in the Midst of Suffering. And the text is found in the first six verses of 1 Peter chapter 4. So when we look into the Bible and we read this passage of Scripture, we see that Peter has spoken to the churches in Asia Minor concerning their resolve to live godly lives in the face of hardship and so as to spread the good news of salvation through Jesus to a world that is blinded by darkness. He reminds the saints that they are partnered with Jesus in his spreading of his message, both in the way that they speak and in the way that they act, being ready in whatever season they find themselves in, even if it means times of suffering for the sake of the gospel, to give an answer for the hope that they have found in Christ. So this week we're continuing in 1 Peter chapter 4, and I'll be starting with the first two verses. Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude, because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. As a result, they do not live the rest of their earthly lives for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. Of particular note, um, the Lord is keenly interested in his people living lives exemplifying his holiness, reflecting his holiness with hearts that are in sync with him. Now many people ask what God wants them to do with their lives. I mean, I've asked that many times. God, what do you want with me? How would you like me to, to live my life? Now this passage of scripture in 1 Peter answers the question. God wants us to develop a perspective um, that looks to what Jesus wants. And I say develop because um, suffering is used as a tool by God to keep us focused on the right perspective. And when we encounter suffering, our attitude shifts from self-focus to God-focus. And when we focus on ourselves, we find that our old nature vies for attention and, and we drift away from God. There's nothing wrong with enjoying and being thankful for what God gives us to enjoy, but the problem is that when the things of this world become so important, um, the fading and fleeting things of this world can distract us from, from what is truly important in life and how God wants us to live it. When believers get out of focus and get their minds off Christ and his kingdom, they naturally gravitate towards self-focus. Now this is why God allows us, many times, why God allows us to encounter suffering. It's so we will not fall in love with ourselves and the sensual cravings of the old nature um, that we have the, the tendency to drift towards. And what glorifies Jesus? 
God is glorified when we live for his kingdom purposes and we arm ourselves with the same attitude that he displayed. And nobody exemplifies the selfless dedication and true heroism to lay one's own interests aside for the sake of the interests of others better than Jesus Christ. Jesus' sacrifice for others has not been paralleled in human history. Our Creator embraced suffering so that we might be saved from the death penalty of sin. Jesus did not have to do what he did, but he sacrificially gave up his own rights to comfort, and he embraced suffering in order to save us. There is not a single one of us here today who is worthy of this great gift that Jesus Christ gave us. Despite how we see ourselves, we're sinners, desperately lost without the Savior. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 3, 10 to 12, as it is written, No one is righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is not one who does good, not even one. But the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords, loved us despite of our rebel disposition. Even though our sins against the Lord were so great, Jesus stepped up and he took the hit for us. He willingly submitted himself not only to a quick and painless death, he submitted himself to evil brutality against him. He suffered injustice when he took the beating and was nailed to the cross to die the price for the penalty of our sins. As Jesus suffered, his attitude was humble and gentle. He did not deserve what had happened to him, but he willingly took the suffering so that you and I could have everlasting life. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God had mercy on us, and by his grace he draws us to himself. He beckons to us by the power of his Holy Spirit. And all who are thirsty, all who are broken can come to him can come to the altar and lay their burdens down and Jesus will not turn one soul away that comes to him and asks him for his forgiveness. Peter says to the church in our text that just as Jesus Christ suffered for us and gave everything up for us, we also ought to arm ourselves with the same attitude. Now, I find it very interesting that he tells us as believers to arm ourselves with the attitude of Christ. Now, some people out there get the wrong idea about, about true Christians. Maybe it's from a book they read. Maybe it's a movie they've watched. Maybe it's a disobedient believer that they've seen living wrongly. And this has been a label placed on Christianity because political forces using Christianity as a vehicle for establishing power in the world, sometimes individuals accepting Christ because they think that by having God on their side, they can take what they want from life to make their life great here and now because as a king's kid, they deserve the absolute best. Whether they be popes or bishops, or kings, or preachers, or individuals throughout history, many times Jesus has been wrongfully represented in a militant way. And the kingdom of God was misrepresented as a vehicle of man's expression for his own interests at the expense of other people. Powerful churches, powerful armies, powerful people used to establish human power in this world. It is true that the Lord has been with armies in the past. And there have been times in modern history where God answered prayers and granted miraculous victories to soldiers fighting against evil and oppressive systems. It's also true that sometimes God blesses people with an easy life in the here and now. But according to the total weight of what we see in Scripture, this is the exception and not the rule. 
The statement that we are called to here to arm ourselves with the attitude of Christ in context with the um, with suffering. It flies in the face of the common understanding of preparation for battle. Peter says it here, but what does it actually mean? Well, for one thing, warfare that we fight in the battles of the spiritual realm, they're fought with very different weapons than what we commonly see in the physical realm. And sometimes people get their wires crossed. In military terms, we arm ourselves, when we arm ourselves, we arm ourselves for the purpose of advancing our cause and defending ourselves against the forces that oppose us. That's commonly understood. There's an old cliche which says, don't bring a knife to a gunfight. Human nature wants to take up arms and strike first before getting hit. When we're facing a conflict, be it physical attack, a conversational or an ideological battle, human nature wants to make sure we gain the upper hand so that we are sure to win a victory. So when we consider arming ourselves in preparation for any kind of fight, we're not arming ourselves in order to sit on the sidelines, to sit on our haunches, in fear, we arm ourselves to prepare to take ground that has been entrenched by an enemy that is coming against us. But contrary to our natural human desire to defend our ground and triumph over threats towards us by our physical strength or wit, in this passage, the Apostle Peter has been calling us to be willing to do what is good even when evil is done to us. To do the right thing just like Jesus did, even if this means taking a major hit, even if there is no doubt that we will end up suffering for it. In the case of spiritual war, we uh, we are called by God to take ground differently than the world prepares us to take ground when we arm ourselves. Sometimes what we see God asking us to do in our natural selves doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Consider the example of the Israelites doing battle with Jericho. You remember that story. The victory that they won was won in a very different way than most armies approach uh, a siege or, or, or a war. They did not act except in obedience to God. They waited on God to give them the right signals, and they obeyed the Lord even when it didn't seem that what God was asking them to do made any sense at all. Can you imagine being asked to sing praises to God in the middle of a battle and and walk around a city with uh, with the spiritual leaders up front? That, that doesn't make sense from a military standpoint. Now, they knew that their God was bigger than the battle that presented itself before them. There were giants in that fortress, bigger people, stronger people, people that would be able to run them down and run them over if they were only facing them with their natural talents, abilities, and circumstances. But God had a different plan. But to have that plan fulfilled, they needed to act in obedience with what God had asked them to do. Now, similarly, Paul says in the scriptures, in support of what Peter is saying here, the weapons the believer has in his possession have divine power to demolish strongholds. And even when believers have physical strength or great uh, intelligence or wit, to oppose the kingdom that appears to stand against them, God wants to engage in the battle in a different way. He wants, to, he wants us to see who the real enemy is. It's not the physical systems of this world that may be puppeting uh, from orders that are given by the true enemy. The opposition that we face against the kingdom of God in this world comes directly from the kingdom of darkness, 
from the kingdom of Satan. 2 Corinthians 10, 4-5 says, The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of this world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take every thought captive to make it obedient to Christ. So we see in this supporting verse in 2 Corinthians that the Apostle Paul has told the believers that contrary to weapons of the warfare that is done in this world, the weapons we fight with in the spiritual realm have divine power to demolish spiritual strongholds. The weapons we use to demolish these strongholds are none other than having the attitude of Christ. In other words, taking a bow to the sovereign hand of God to take up the fight on our behalf. In support of this thought from the Apostle Paul that we've gone to, in our text today, the Apostle Peter is telling us that we must arm ourselves with these attitudes of Christ in regard to suffering. When we look at Jesus, how did Jesus respond to suffering? Jesus willingly took the hit for us knowing that it would cost him his life knowing that it would cost him immense pain and discomfort. He suffered for us, willingly gave himself up for us. Why? Because of his love for us and his desire to see us saved. We see it even when he was hanging on the cross, being tortured terribly, having his hand, his, his wrists and his feet punctured by nails, brutally having a, a crown of thorns driven over the top of his head and being mocked and spit at. What did he do when he looked out over the people that were watching his brutal execution? He said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. What are these strongholds? The strongholds and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, as a soldier in God's army, we're in a battle of opposing ideas. Do not be deceived, my friends. The the ideas and arguments around us that are opposed to the truth, they come straight from the enemy, Satan, and his invisible forces, who ensure to press against humanity to accept them and we are standing in the way of their objectives. As the Lord our God and creator of the universe is good, and he lives in the light, the devil and his horde are evil, and they live in the darkness, and they live by the lie. James 1.17 says, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. God's thoughts are pure, holy, and righteous. The enemy's thoughts are corrupted, and the plan, the plans and, and the thinking that he places in his subject, in his subjects, are darkened and deceived. The attack that the enemy brings against believers in Christ are darkened thoughts concerning the discernment of the truth and the reality of things as they really are. Darkened thoughts are sinful thoughts. And sinful thoughts are rebellious thoughts toward God and the truth. They come to oppose God's thoughts. So don't be surprised. When you stand up for what is right, when you live what is right, don't be surprised that the enemy will not come at you and attack you and cause you to suffer. But don't be in dismay. Long ago, David said in his prayer to God in Psalm 119, 105, Your word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. The Bible instructs humanity that the word of God is true. And when Jesus prayed to the Father for protection for the ones who would turn their back on the devil and his system of rebellion and would believe in him, he really meant this. John 
chapter 17, 15 to 19, Jesus Christ prayed for us, knowing full well all the way through history, those that would reject the darkness and would accept the Lord's way would, would be pressed. He knew this. And he says, My prayer is not that you would take them out of the world, but that you would protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. What comforting words from our Creator. God's word is truth. God's work is sanctification through His Son, Jesus Christ. Sanctification is the process God takes His people through to purify them and to conform them to the image of Himself. Romans 8.29 For those who God foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. My friends, we are purified by the truth. And that truth brings freedom into people's lives. Satan encounters it by raising up a lie, by whispering a darkened thought through a pretension that raises itself up against the knowledge of God by saying that what God says is good is actually bad. And then Satan tries to twist God's word. And the world around us buys into all of these lies. And when we stand up for the truth, and we stand on the foundation of the truth of God's Word, the Apostle Peter says that we will suffer for it. When you face suffering for doing good and for following God's Word rather than the deception of the lies from, from Satan, you are arming yourselves with the attitude of Christ. How then does God want us to behave when attacked by those who are acting as the puppets for the devil's agenda? Well, in ourselves, we want to do what our flesh wants to do. We want to fight back. We want to level the playing field and get the upper hand to assure us of victory. But the light of God's Word says that we war in a way that is different than the world. And we need to respond differently than what we naturally want to do. We need to respond with the power of God's Word that is made alive in us by the power of His Holy Spirit who lives in us. Jesus said in Matthew 5.43, You have heard it said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be the children of the Father in heaven. He causes His Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. Do you see the attitude of Christ here? Peter is telling us to arm ourselves with this attitude. When we arm ourselves with the attitude of Christ in relation to suffering, we see that Christ attitude pushes us towards obedience to God rather than to sin. Sin is disobedience to God's Word. We're tempted to sin when people come at us and persecute us. We're tempted to take the battle into our own hands and fight on our own terms. When we attempt to fight the people who cause us to suffer with the weapons of this world rather than Christ's prescription to pray for your enemy and love your enemy. You see, we're sinning against God. It is a sin. Peter has just shown us how Jesus was willing to do good even if it led to his suffering and his death. And now he's going to challenge us to embrace the same attitude by showing us what a powerful weapon it is against our sinful passions and temptations. Let's read verse 2 of our text again. As, verses 1 and 2, 
Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude, because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. As a result, they do not live the rest of their earthly lives for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. Now, it may not seem like a very powerful weapon to have an attitude like like, uh, what Christ displayed during suffering, But when we submit ourselves to serving God, no matter what, just like he did, we give the Holy Spirit access to the very recesses of our being. And as a result, it switches us into a new way of thinking, a new path of thinking. Now, this is not easy. It is a deep work of God's Spirit within the fabric of our being. There's a battle within us. But our weapon for overcoming is to arm ourselves with the attitude of Christ in regarding to enduring any suffering that we encounter. In understanding this, there is great spiritual growth. When we suffer for righteousness' sake, God knows that we look to him for our strength rather than to ourselves. C.S. Lewis put it this way. We can ignore even pleasure, but pain insists on being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. So when we're called to arm ourselves with the attitude of Christ, when we're really going through it, when everything inside of us recoils and tells us to rise up and rebel against this instruction to love our enemies, This is precisely the point at which God shouts to us that we desperately need him. And this is precisely the time that when we yield, despite how reacting in this way seems counterintuitive to our natural wisdom, that we need to obey the Lord. Christ displayed incredible patience and trust in the Father, waiting on the Lord for his deliverance. If it was his will, but ultimately knowing the course that was set would cost him his very life. And Christ was willing to do good and to be obedient to the Father's will, even if it meant suffering or discomfort, even if it meant death on the cross. Spiritually speaking, when we humble ourselves before God and accept the suffering that comes our way, it's like we've traveled over a railway switch that moves us off of one path and on to another. It moves us from simply pursuing our own sinful desires, which is what we all do naturally, to pursuing the will of God no matter what. This new track is a renewed mind. It is spiritually derived from strength from God's Spirit dwelling within us. The new track enables us to look at our world through a different set of lenses that is freed from the bondage of sin. It is the power that gives us strength to overcome, to endure to the end any hardship that we encounter with joy, even if it means if we have to wait patiently for deliverance or even if it means that we face death in this body. The weapon we are armed with is the very word of God. We no longer look at things the same way. Suffering is a vehicle that actually enables us to gain victory over our fleshly desires that rage against the Spirit of God. It enables us to agree with the writer of the book of James who says in James chapter 1, 2 to 6, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your Faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. I really believe that the reason many believers are lacking joy in their lives is because they have less than a a mature and complete view of God's goodness, sovereignty, and ultimate eternal plan. They have not come to terms with the true purpose that God permits suffering. Arming ourselves with the same attitude that Christ displayed in regards to suffering enables us to overcome the nature of sin. In 1 Peter 4, 3-6, Peter continues saying, 
for you've spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing in detestable idolatry. They're surprised that you do not join them in their reckless, wild living, and they heap abuse upon you. But they will have to give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is the reason the gospel was preached, even to those who are now dead, so that they might be judged according to human standards in regards to the body, but live according to God in regards to the spirit. There can be no doubt about it. When you live your life for Christ Jesus, your heart's desires will change because of the presence of the Spirit of Christ within you. Your desire to do wicked things will be put in check by your earnest desire to commit your life to serving God. It is certain when you do this, you will suffer when you reject the easy and wide path that this temporary pleasure-filled world brings you that leads to destruction and, and in you instead choose to embrace the narrow and more difficult path of holy living that leads to life? Part of the suffering will be social. Part will be ideological. And some may even be physical. If you follow the path of Jesus, you'll have to endure the jeers, the social isolation that comes from worldly-minded people who are not of your frame of mind. They will mock your personal choice to follow Christ and they will show their surprise and contempt for your change in attitude or your desire to reject in joining in with them and doing what they are doing. Now verse 6 is a difficult passage and it's often been misinterpreted. The truth in verse 6 of our passage here is that in context of honoring God through persecution and suffering, some people like the first martyr of the church, Stephen, suffered to the point of giving up their lives for the sake of the gospel. Peter is telling believers to consider the faith of those who had gone before them. They received the gospel which had been preached to them and they received it and stood up to the people who were standing against them and judging them with human standards. They did not shrink back from the attacks of those who were, who were mocking them. They did not shrink back from death or deny that Jesus Christ was their Savior. These people who were uh, those that took a stand in their testimony before being slain. These are saints, valiant souls, keeping their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus to the very end, serving as an example of those who embrace the same attitude arming themselves with the same attitude of Christ in the midst of their own sufferings and as a result receive eternal life in their spirits just as the saints who had gone before them who had accepted the word of God preached to them received eternal life in their spirits. Roman 8, Romans 8.15-22 8, uh, speaks about uh, this whole thing I'm not going to read all of the verses, but I, I do want to read verse 18 where Paul agrees with Peter and he says this, he says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. See, God planned it this way. Our suffering in this physical realm will, will be soon folded up in a moment of time. It will all melt away. One day, very soon, our, our loving Creator is going to bring the suffering of His saints to an end. A new heaven and a new earth will change all of the rules. Jesus is coming soon, and He's coming to make everything right. The new creation will be better than the most exquisite paradise here on the earth for all of eternity. So we should be assured today that all things work together for good to those who love God. God has an eternal plan. So we should completely trust in Him. No matter what happens, no matter what we must go through, either, either good or evil, nothing occurs by accident, friends. Everything happens by God permitting it. Everything happens by the decree of God. 
2020 was no accident. The problems associated with it and the suffering that resulted from it was not a matter of Satan gaining some kind of upper hand as though God and His omniscience, omnipresence and omnipotence were somehow not in play. Human events and choices please the Lord or displease Him, but they never perplex Him. Human choices may elicit His love or evoke His wrath. They demonstrate His grace, maybe, or His judgment. When God permits His people to suffer, though, He is ultimately accomplishing an eternal purpose through it because He loves us. And all things work together for good to those who love the Lord and are called according to His purpose. In recognizing this and coming to terms with this as His children, we need to arm ourselves with the same attitude as Jesus Christ. Would you arm yourself with the same attitude as Christ in this coming new year? I pray that you will. Let us, let us thank the Lord today. God, we thank you for being with us in the midst of the times that we face. God, we don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. We don't know what this new year is going to bring, but we know that you are sovereign, O oh God, and that you are in control of all things, and that nothing escapes your gaze. I pray, God, that you would just minister into the lives of the people that are out there. Those that are going through difficulties, Lord, I pray that they would, they would see the big picture, that you are working everything together for good. Lord, you never allow us to, to suffer without a purpose. So Lord, would we be given strength beyond ourselves from you? We need you, Jesus. Father, help us to be armed with the same attitude that you had when you faced your mission here on the earth. Help us to face our mission as like-minded individuals and to face it in the way that you faced it. Help us, Lord, not to respond to the persecution and to the attacks of the enemy through his puppets here on the earth or through principalities and powers directly. Help us to praise you and to look to you as the author and perfecter of our faith. For on you, Lord, we place our trust and you are the rock, the firm foundation for our faith. And we praise you and we thank you for this day. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful Sunday afternoon.